After the devastating defeat of Vijayanagar forces at the Battle of Talikotas in 1565, the victorious armies of the Sultanates to the north swept into this city. Now, Vijayanagar was one of the biggest cities in the world in the 1400s and the 1500s. It's one of the great urban sprawls on earth. And uh, the Sultanates to the north, they swept in, and for five months, maybe for as long as 12 months, they systematically obliterated the city pillaging, raping, looting, killing, defacing of temples. By the time they were done, the city was mostly a wasteland. Now there was a brief attempt to resettle it later. It failed and it was ultimately abandoned forever. Now the empire, the Vijayanagar Empire, is one of the great empires in Indian history, the greatest empire in South Indian history for sure. Uh, it survived, now only as a shell of its former self. It survived. Uh, its capital was moved to another place, but it never enjoyed anything close to the sort of power that it once had. Its power had been broken. And Vijayanagar just may be the most incredible city that you've never heard of. A casualty of a, an Indian history, a historical narrative, mostly authored by North Indians. South Indian history often comes off as sort of a footnote in the overall Indian narrative, if there is such a thing. Uh, something added to the textbooks or to this or that history book out of a, a need to, you know, make it complete. And that's it. Now, that's not always true, but that's often true. And I think a lot of South Indians feel that. That's unfortunate. Uh, and it, when it comes to the history of Vijayanagar and the recognition of Vijayanagar as a wonder of the world, I think that might just be reflected. Uh, certainly was a wonder of the world in its time. I've mentioned its size. Half a million to a million inhabitants enclosed in seven concentric walls. The diameter of, the, of the, that outside wall being 60 miles. This was a massive urban sprawl. And when foreign visitors came from places like Persia or Portugal, they were amazed with what they saw. You know, they, they viewed the forts and the palaces and the gardens and the massive irrigation works and the, the orchards and the lakes. And of course, the hundreds of temples. And uh, they were stunned. You know, uh, a Persian visitor wrote that Vijayanagar was uh, possessed of grandeur unmatched anywhere in the world. I think of where he's from. And when the Portuguese showed up, uh, they said basically the same thing. So that's coming from Persia. That's coming from Europe. Um, that's high praise. And the Portuguese, when they showed up, they captured the, the horse trade. The Vijayanagar kings needed foreign horses. India has never been good at horse raising. And so they imported their horses from the Arabian Peninsula and the Portuguese captured that trade. So now they dealt in horses and so now they dealt with Vijayanagar. The... So they knew what they were talking about. These visitors had been here and uh, yeah, they were stunned by what they saw. There's Vijayanagar is trading far and wide, trading with Europe in the West, trading with Southeast Asia in the East. In fact, even controlling pockets of territory in Southeast Asia for a time. This was a mighty city, the capital of a mighty empire. Now a whole mythology has grown up around Vijayanagar. Its founding, its purpose, and its fall. Okay, so according to tradition, it was founded by two brothers, Harihara and Bukka. These guys were battling the Delhi Sultan, or the Delhi Sultanate's forces. This would have been at the time of the probably mentally unstable Muhammad Tugluk. And they were captured and imprisoned in Delhi where they converted to Islam. And having convinced the Sultan that their conversion was genuine, they were dispatched by him to South India to put down a rebellion or possibly to spread the Islamic faith. Of course, once they got there, they did no such thing. Instead, they declared their independence. They reconverted back to Shaivite Hinduism and uh, they founded an empire. A couple generations later, that empire controlled virtually all of South India, a feat rarely, if ever, accomplished before. Well, the military adventures of the Delhi Sultanate in central and especially southern India, these were short-lived. 
but they left behind some sultanates, some breakaway sultanates, and in particular the great Bomani Sultanate in the Deccan. And this was the great sworn enemy of Vijayanagar. There is a reason that Vijayanagar, the city itself, was a veritable fortress. Well, eventually the Bamani Sultanate broke up into five other great sultanates, Bijapur, Berar, Bidar, Ahmednagar, and Golconda. And uh, you know, for two centuries, Vijayanagar and the sultanates to the north battled each other. I mean, they, they hated each other. This struggle is often painted by Hindu nationalists as an epic Hindu versus Muslim struggle. One in which, you know, the heroic Vijayanagar Empire stands as this great, or sort of the last great Hindu bulwark against the encroaching, you know, foreign Muslim invaders, sort of how it's portrayed. Certainly Vijayanagar was a Hindu empire, I mean, there's no question about it. There's a city in particular, and this was Hindu. I mentioned the hundreds of temples already. The hundreds of temples, thousands of pilgrims at any given time. Of course, the city itself was built at a site brimming with Hindu tradition. Many sites associated with Shiva, sites associated with King Ram, the perfect king and incarnation of Vishnu. You can see how these associations would lend legitimacy and could be used politically by the regime. So definitely, this was, in many ways, absolutely a Hindu empire. Well, after the breakup of the Bamani Sultanate that I mentioned into five smaller sultanates, and they bickered a lot with each other, and Vijayanagar contributed to that. In fact, Vijayanagar, the kings of Vijayanagar, became very adept at uh, playing them off each other. And it worked very well for Vijayanagar for a long time. It was only when Vijayanagar, when, when its ambitions got a little big, decided to expand northwards, north of the Krishna, at the expense of the sultanates, this was enough to stop their bickering and unite them temporarily. And together, of course, we know what happened. The Battle of Talikota, the devastation of Vijayanagar city, and the end of an era. The Hindu nationalist narrative that paints the Vijayanagar empire as this bastion of Hinduism up against, you know, the onslaught of the Muslim invader. Upon closer inspection, this sort of a superficial way to look at things. It turns out to be more of a comic book level analysis than anything that reflects actual reality. The very founders of Vijayanagar, Harihara and Bukka, probably got their prototype for empire from Muslim sultanates. We know that the city of Vijayanagar had a Muslim quarter in it. We know that some of the later kings and emperors of Vijayanagar used the title Sultan, or at least Sultan among the Hindus. Some of them too, and this includes Krishna Devaraya, who's considered the, sort of the greatest of the Vijayanagar kings, the, the zenith of the empire uh, was experienced during his reign. Uh, these guys employed Muslim soldiers, they had Muslim officers in their armies. Islamic uh, uh, influence is evident very strongly in court culture, uh, dress, other aspects of Vijayanagar society. Uh, and then you look at the sultanates too. I mean, the sultanates, these sultans are ruling over a vast Hindu majority population. They're having to rule very syncretistically. They're all just military polities sort of battling it out with each other. And it often doesn't matter who they're up against. They'll fight, you know, a Muslim sultanate will fight another Muslim sultanate. Hindu kingdoms fight other Hindu kingdoms. So all this serves to sort of muddy the waters and maybe temper the temptation to look at all of this as simply... Hindu versus Muslim. That's one element of a much more complicated picture. But it would be a mistake to discount this element entirely, obviously. I mean, the Hindu-Muslim element was there. The question is, was it the driving force when it comes to Vijayanagara history, when it, when it comes to the relation between Vijayanagara and the Sultanates? Now that's open to debate. And there are scholars and politicians, tellingly, who have called for the complete non-use of the terms Hindu and Muslim when referring to Indian states and rulers. So that's probably swinging too far the other way. We know that nationalists like to take complicated history and uh, oversimplify it, comic bookize it, to buoy up their narratives. Maybe what's most important here is that for millions of Indians, for millions of uh, Hindu nationalists, the Muslim Hindu aspect 
of Vijayanagar's history, that's what's magnified, that's what's underscored. That's the be all and end all. The travesty of the takedown of Vijayanagar by these sultanates is seen as the, just another example of the great depravity of the Muslim invaders. Now that may or may not be true. That may or may not be nationalist comic bookization. Is that what's happened with Vijayanagar's history? Well, I don't know, you be the judge.